HMS Rodney is a ship that continues to capture the imagination of naval historians, enthusiasts, and even model makers who dreamed of her as boys. While most people know her for her decisive role in the sinking of Bismarck, there is much more to her story. In this feature, we explore what set Rodney apart from her sister ship, HMS Nelson, examining her unique design, capabilities, and the subtle differences that often go unnoticed. From crew accounts to operational quirks, we aim to uncover the elements of Rodney's history that make her not just a battleship, but a remarkable symbol of British naval power. HMS Rodney is often described as a twin to HMS Nelson. But those who study these two ships closely know that they were never truly identical. On paper they carried the same firepower, the same armor scheme, and the same unusual layout with all three main turrets forward. But once you look deeper, the differences begin to appear, and those differences shaped HMS Rodney's entire service. Rodney was built at Camel Laird, while Nelson came from Armstrong's yard. Both shipyards worked from the same drawings, but each brought its own construction habits, suppliers, and engineering practices. The result was two ships that looked identical on paper, yet emerged with subtle differences that gave Rodney a personality all her own. These differences showed up most clearly in her internal layout and machinery. Passageways shifted slightly, ventilation around the machinery spaces was revised during construction, and her trim and weight distribution ended up just enough off from Nelson's to change her feel. Officers often remarked that Rodney handled differently, not worse, simply different, as though she had her own rhythms in heavy water. Most famously, Rodney suffered more mechanical trouble than her sister. Her turbines and auxiliaries were finicky, and her electrical systems developed a reputation for being temperamental. These weren't life-threatening flaws, but they were persistent, following her throughout her career. Part of the problem came from workmanship, part from the specific equipment fitted, and part from the tight treaty-era budgets under which she was built. Externally, the two ships were nearly indistinguishable, the same broad bow, the same massive three-tiered forward silhouette, the same all-forward gun layout. But inside, Rodney was no clone. Her redesigned airflow, shifting compartment arrangements, and the variations introduced during construction made her a distinct ship behind the armor. These distinctions shaped the story of her design evolution. So let's take a closer look at what made Rodney unique. Both Nelson and Rodney used the striking all-forward arrangement of their 16-inch turrets. A and B sat in the familiar super-firing pair, with C set slightly aft but still ahead of the bridge. Concentrating the main armament forward allowed the armored citadel to be dramatically shortened. Less length to protect meant heavier armor where it mattered most, a priceless advantage under treaty limits. Rodney inherited this layout, but it influenced her handling in its own way. Her bow tended to bury itself more in heavy seas, and veterans recalled that at high speed she pushed water aside a bit less gracefully than Nelson. She was never unsafe, simply marked by her own quirks. The octopoidal tower, tall, multi-layered, and instantly recognizable, earned both ships the nickname Queen Anne's Mansions. Yet Rodney's tower was not a perfect twin. During her build, internal communication rooms, plotting spaces, and fire control wiring were rearranged to improve survivability or to accommodate equipment substitutions. To an outside observer the towers were identical. To the men working within them, Rodney's was its own environment, with different airflow, different workflow, and its own small inconveniences and advantages. Where Rodney truly diverged from Nelson was in machinery reliability. Her turbines behaved unpredictably. Auxiliary machinery was more prone to faults. Electrical issues cropped up with frustrating frequency, and her boilers demanded more constant attention to maintain pressure. Early in her life these were manageable frustrations, later, as the pace of wartime operations increased, they became a defining challenge of her service. Camel Laird used a slightly different mix of subcontractors. The financial strain of the late 1920s led to cost-cutting in non-critical systems. 
the Royal Navy at the time was transitioning between engineering standards and some equipment was newly introduced. The result was Rodney had a reputation for being less dependable than Nelson. Officers who served on both ships frequently mentioned the difference, and wartime reports confirm it. When the ship was pushed hard, her engines could be moody. When she needed to sprint, she sometimes struggled. But she always got the job done, even if her engineers had to fight for every knot. At a distance, Rodney and Nelson appeared identical. But experts can spot the distinctions. Rodney's bridge windows were framed slightly differently. Her boat cranes were fitted at a slightly altered angle. Her external wireless aerial fits differed because of newer radio equipment introduced between her laying down and her completion. Some of her upper works appear more compact in photographs due to these adjustments. Even her paintwork often age differently, sailors joke that Rodney always looked more tired, partly due to her harder machinery life causing more grime and maintenance staining. Months at sea quickly teach a man every quirk of his ship, and aboard the Nelson class those quirks were impossible to miss. Officers who transferred between the two sisters commented that walking Rodney's passageways felt familiar, but never identical, like visiting a house built from the same blueprint but furnished by different people. We do have real historical accounts from engineering reports and crew memoirs. Many described Rodney as spacious in places, cramped in others, a powerful but stubborn ship, a vessel that needed calm engineers. Rodney's gun crews loved the power of the 16-inch rifles, but they complained about blast effects being felt heavily on the forecastle. Her bridge crews appreciated the excellent forward visibility but disliked how the giant a turret blocked view when trained across the bow. There were also unofficial comments that Rodney vibrated more at certain speeds compared to Nelson. This seems to have been true and related to imperfections in the machinery alignment. None of this diminished her reputation, but rather, it made her a ship with a personality, one sailors remembered more often than not. Rodney, like Nelson, received machine gun anti-aircraft mounts on top of her main turrets later in her career. These didn't come early, turret top anti-aircraft guns were not part of the original design and they were added as the air threat became undeniable in the late 1930s. So half-inch Vickers machine gun mounts, eight-barrel pom-poms, and later, various light anti-aircraft weapons depending on what the Royal Navy had on hand were installed. But the question you may be asking, were the crews above protected from the main gun's blast? These mounts were shielded by armored tubs and blast-deflecting shields. They were definitely not perfectly comfortable when the main guns fired, but they were not exposed directly to the blast either. The Royal Navy tested these fits extensively before adoption. The turrets were so massive and so strong that they could accommodate these additions without structural worry, a testament to just how overbuilt the forward barbettes and turret crowns were. While the Nelson sisters often shared refits, Rodney received several modifications that were either unique to her or more pronounced. Due to her greater tendency to bury her bow, Rodney received additional strengthening and minor modifications to improve seakeeping. Rodney's aircraft catapult and handling arrangements were tweaked more than Nelson's, partly due to equipment availability when her systems were serviced. Rodney's communication upgrades in the late 1930s incorporated different wireless sets, leading to further small changes in her topside fitting. Rodney received a reinforcement in certain machinery compartments, after the previously mentioned vibration reports, a modification Nelson did not require to nearly the same extent. These differences were small and isolated over time, but collectively they gave the ship a distinct engineering footprint. HMS Rodney ended her career at Inverkeithing, arriving worn but unmistakable, a ship that had played a decisive role in the destruction of Bismarck. Rodney was retired and scrapped at 31,763 tons, a figure that reflected Britain's honor, and even while adhering to the Washington Naval Treaty limits, she remained capable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with any opponent. Many other nations treated the limit more as a guideline than a rule, Bismarck and others quietly exceeded theirs. 
even though later assessment sometimes judged Nelson and Rodney as less impressive compared to newer battleship designs, there is a certain irony in the fact that these treaty-bound ships stayed within the rules and still performed when it mattered most. She was never meant to be glamorous, but she was reliable, heavily armed, and crucial when it mattered most. Her and her sister Nelson scrapping marked the end of a unique design, one born from the limits of international agreements yet capable of immense power. Rodney remains remembered in naval history, not just for her firepower, but for her service record, her resilience, and the decisive role she played in shaping the outcome of the war. From the gun decks to the bridge, every story we tell honors those who served. If this tale made you feel the salt and steel of history, give it a like, and if you're not yet part of our channel's convoy, subscribe and join the ranks, more powerful stories await.